So welcome to everyone. Uh, this is webinar six in the SHINE webinar series. Uh, we're delighted this afternoon to welcome uh, Professor Gordon Harold uh, from the University of Cambridge. Uh, Professor Harold is the inaugural um, Professor of the Psychology of Education and Mental Health uh, at the University and is also the Director of eNurture. And we're delighted that he's able to join us this afternoon to share his expertise and research in this very important area. Obviously, the year um, of COVID has uh, had us all living our lives through our screens. And so we're all very aware of the challenges and the also many of the benefits that that, that brings. Um, but also, um, it does raise many questions about the impact of um, development um, on young people. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to hearing first a presentation from Professor Harold and then afterwards there'll be uh, an opportunity for some discussion and hopefully lots of questions um, relating to uh, the educational setting. Okay, so without further ado, uh, ado I'm going to hand over to Professor Harold. Welcome. Don, thank you very much. So please, please call me Gordon. <laughs> uh, working at home, you don't have people calling you professor when you're at home, so, so please call me Gordon. So Don, thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you all very much for, for coming along today and Dawn for the invitation to speak to the, to the Shine Network. It's late in the day uh, on a Wednesday. I think we are still Wednesday. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time uh, to come along. So as Don said, I, I'm professor of the psychology of education and mental health at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I'm also director of what's called the Nurture Network or eNurture, which is one of eight um, UKRI, Economic Social Research Council, funded mental health networks. Um, so hello to Joe Inchley, also um, of the Triumph Network up there in Scotland. Um, um, I'm also joined today by uh, Srimi Chan, Dr. Srimi Chan, who's our, our network coordinator. Uh, in the short amount of time, I'm going to try to give you a brief overview of the area of child and adolescent mental health with, with just sort of very top level summary information um, and introduce you to a relatively new research initiative in the, in the last two years, uh, which is eNurture, um, specifically a research initiative aimed at advancing understanding of how we promote and support young people's mental health, uh, specifically with a focus on the digital world. Um, I'll try to give a set a land speed record of going through some, some background evidence. So I'm going to try and summarize the, if you like, the state of the nation around child and adolescent mental health. I'm going to use a slide that tries to explain the multiple influences on children's development, typical versus atypical development, um, and new questions and need for new information um, if we are to better understand how we support young people's development and particularly young people's mental health. Uh, and then spend some time introducing you to, to the objectives of, uh, of eNurture. You probably pick up from my accent, I'm from Dublin, I'm Irish, and as when I'm short of time, I speak more quickly. So don't if I speak too quickly, don't hesitate to pause and tell me to slow down ever so slightly. Okay, so a little, little bit of background. Um, for this audience, we won't need too much introduction to uh, the current state of the nation, if you like, in terms of young people's mental health. <clears throat> so mental health in the UK and also internationally is an area of significant national and international priority. Presently estimates, and these are most recent estimates, uh, one in six children and adolescents. So children, I'm gonna, when I speak, speak, use the term children, it'll be transitioning into primary school up to age 18. That doesn't preclude younger children or, or slightly older young people, those transitioning to early adulthood. But that's the age group I'm going to focus on in terms of evidence, about three and a half up to age 18. So with that age group in mind, one in six children, it's um, estimated, presently experience serious mental health problems. One in five adults uh, costs at around 100 billion pounds per year in the UK, specifically focused on mental health. And by 2030, it's expected that mental health problems uh, will impact globally the level of $16 trillion, particularly with a focus on anxiety and depression as being a primary influencer uh, in terms of rising rates of mental health and mental health problems. The estimates, the one in six and one in five are very recent estimates in the last three months. The, the, the financial estimates, the, the, the UK costs and the global costs are pre-pandemic. So it's likely that those costs will be significantly greater in the coming years. In terms of young people's mental health in the UK, rates of depression, anxiety, self-harm, substance misuse, and suicide are among the highest in economically well-off countries. 
uh, in October of last year, the Good Childhood Report came out, people will probably be aware of that, locating children in the United Kingdom aged between 10 and 15 years as doing least well in multiple areas of well-being, including mental health, relative to 24 other countries. Um, there's still a bit of a debate as to whether mental health problems among young people are on the rise or whether such rates are more a product of increased reporting. Um, either way, rates are extremely high, uh, unsustainable in terms of long-term impacts. And studies that measure, for example, objectif objectively identifiable problems such as self-harm are showing a very clear increase in rates of self-harm among young people. A recent study showed eight, seven to nine-year-olds uh, reporting elevated rates of self-harm. Um, so these problems are going up and um, they're serious. And whether it's a function of reporting or not, uh, not taking the problem seriously uh, places wider society at greater risk long-term for those problems to develop into more serious problems um, as young people progress into adulthood <clears throat> and parenthood, et cetera. It's recognized now that 75% of very serious mental health problems, psychiatric disorder in adulthood are in place before the age of 18 years. Um, therefore, understanding the influences, the origins, the, the, the mechanisms, the processes that explain rates of mental health problems and rising rates of mental health problems and spe specific areas of mental health disorder before the age of 18 years will likely significantly assist reducing those problems later in life. And mental health, importantly, poor mental health <coughs> has significant impacts on education, physical health, and multiple other, multiple other outcomes. Very important to say at the outset that when I use the phrase mental health, mental health is not synonymous with mental disorder or mental illness. Mental health is doing well. Poor mental health is not doing well. And it's understanding deviation from doing well and developing healthily to not doing well and experiencing mental health problems and not developing healthily is key to understanding how we assist and promote well-being, mental health in particular, um, in, among young people. What types of mental health problems do we see in young people? Again, all ages included here. So internalizing problems, depression, anxiety, complex problems such as self-harm. Um, for many years when I was a student and, and not up to very recently, for example, depression was understood to be a problem that really emerged in adolescence and progressed. Depression certainly expresses itself to a greater uh, prevalence level and, um, uh, and degree of severity in adolescence, but it's likely in place or evidencing symptoms in advance of it in teenage years. Um, so understanding how uh, experiences and uh, indicators of mental health problems in childhood may then progress and express in later years, such as ad adolescence, teenage years, is a particularly important development if you're going to more effectively deal with the rising rates of mental health problems. External externalizing problems, conduct and behavior problems, important to differentiate conduct and behavior problems from neurodevelopmental disorders such as ADHD and autism, and increasing evidence around uh, differentiating presentation of those problems, particularly among younger years. Social competence, <clears throat> being able to relate well to other uh, adults, teachers, peers, academic problems, engaging productively in school, academic attainment and progression through the school years and stages of uh, education progress. Physical health problems, physical illness and stress, eating disorders, again, self-harm, substance misuse, and then right through to criminality, homelessness, and suicidality. Uh, across multiple reports, evidence suggests that these problems are going up. And we're going up both in terms of prevalence, going up in terms of uh, presenting severity, and going up in terms of the age at which young people are presenting with early symptoms and such problems. It's also important to point out that when we uh, try, study and try to understand mental health and development and mental health and illness in childhood and adolescence, that mental health problems rarely occur in, in nice, neat, isolated um, domains. So for example, you tend not to see just a depressed child or a child with particular behavior problems, that actually uh, we may see what are called developmental cascades. So depression may precede conduct problems, may precede difficulties relating to other people, may influence academic problems, may cause physical uh, or related health problems, and more serious outcomes in terms of long-term criminality, homelessness, and suicidality. So mental health problems, if left unsupported, uh, unidentified, um, and untreated, if you like, in terms of support, may set the stage for developmental cascades that lead problems both to progress, develop, and actually become more severe and complex over time. We also recognize that young people can experience serious mental health problems without attaining levels of clinical disorder. 
<clears throat> so it's not necessarily the case that one needs to receive a diagnosis of a mental health problem to experience serious mental health challenges. And recognizing symptoms as factors early in the process is a first step towards identifying how we can intervene and support and prevent those problems from progressing to more serious levels of severity. Um, lots of evidence around the rising rates of mental health, and um, lots of reports around mental health, increasing reports around mental health and impact on schools. And um, my particular interest and in the area of research I, I, I represent, if you like, is, is both in, in profiling and presenting, if you like, the severity of uh, particular mental health problems, the prevalence of such mental health problems, but really to understand where those problems come from and what we can do to try to reduce or uh, interrupt or prevent those problems from, from developing further. So um, my core research focus, and again, those that I represent, primarily examine two, two main sets of influences in, in understanding child and adolescent mental health. Genetic factors, which I, I won't go into a great deal here, but increasingly we have evidence that specific genetic factors, specific constellations of genes called polygenic risk scores um, are associated with an array of phenotypes of areas of mental health and development. It's recognized that genetic factors are more risk factors than causal factors when it comes to mental health outcomes. That's a very important thing to, to point out. And environmental factors, classically family, school and peer influences, um, evidence substantial effects on children's long-term development, mental health, well-being. And classically, the interplay between biological factors and environmental factors, as we know, explains a great deal about variation in children's mental health and development. So I want to return to the genetic factors and the environmental factors and try to locate those factors um, in a framework that positions what we are, I guess, collectively trying to promote, which is mental health, well-being, educational attainment, quality educational experience, and long-term life chances, mental health and well-being. Uh, educational attainment and mental health for young people. So this, this is a young person. Um, I gave the, a separate presentation yesterday, so I'm going to try and do this for the second time in 24 hours. But this is a, a young person. And if you were a, a, a cohort of first year undergraduate students and we were doing this live, I'd put this slide up and I said, this young person, and I said, this young person doesn't look particularly happy. Particularly happy. Everyone would agree with me because, of course, I'm a professor and all the first year there nodding away. That doesn't look very happy at all. And I would say, well, the real question is whether this person's presenting behaviors what we regard as typical, expected, or atypical, unexpected. And how do we understand the factors that influence this young person's behavior? This young person may be potentially uh, very angry, and this is a photograph right before he becomes very angry uh, and behaves in a very angry manner. So you know, people are nodding away at me saying, oh yes, clearly this you know, young person is looking potentially very angry. So we try to understand whether the behavior is, is typical or atypical, uh, and what we can do about that such behavior to move from the atypical to the typical. So what factors influence this young person's behavior? And if this young person is representative of general population, what might, what might we expect to see as being replicated behaviors in terms of explanation? So genetic factors, we know genetic factors play a fundamental role uh, in explaining variation or individual differences in child development, child adolescent mental health, and multi physical health in multiple domains, classically nature. Nurture, nurture starts actually um, pre-birth. So intrauterine influences we know affect child and adolescent development, again, mental health development. Low birth weight, for instance, we know is potentially associated with elevated ADHD, related neurodevelopmental problems, and may set the stage for other problems uh, as children progress from childhood infancy and into adolescence. Postnatal environmental factors, classically parenting, quality of the parent-child relationships. Historically, let's focus on the mother-child relationship, but increasingly we're <coughs> recognizing the importance of father-child, mother-child, and co-parenting processes has been significant for children's uh, mental health and development. School environment, we know school environment plays a significant role in terms of children's, again, mental health, well-being, uh, and other areas of development. Peer relationships, these peers are slightly older than this young person, but it was the photograph I could find and use today. Peer relationships, again, a substantial, substantive influence in, on children's development, individual differences in their development. And the field of epigenetics, um, which simply stated is that environmental factors work together with genetic factors, whereby uh, uh, act, environmental factors activate DNA methylation processes, fire up gene systems, uh, which uh, again, evidence uh, in particular influences on, on, on measured outcomes among young people. Each of these areas have their own respective domains of research and research evidence. <clears throat> as you will know, as professionals working with uh, children, in particular in educational settings, that these factors rarely occur in isolation. Actually, they don't occur in isolation. Um, that they work together again in a complex array of processes, interacting processes, fundamentally affecting 
all areas of child and adolescent development. And um, the important point here is to ask the question is, is in terms of this young person's behavior, and again, the undergraduate students are saying this explains a lot about this young person's what clearly looks like um, potentially quite aggressive behavior. And I then say that this young person has stood in Wellington, New Zealand, arrived the previous evening, uh, went out for a walk with his father, saw an ice cream van and asked for an ice cream. He then stood in the queue with his father to get an ice cream, waited there for about 20 minutes, got to the top of the queue, father realized he didn't have any New Zealand currency. The chap selling the ice cream wouldn't give me the ice cream or give the father the ice cream, I should say. Um, so went away, got some New Zealand currency, came back, queued up again, got the ice cream, probably about an hour or so after this young person asked for the ice cream. And right before he tasted it, he put it to his mouth. I said, can I take a photograph of you? So the uh, expression is more seriously or are you, you cannot be serious as compared to necessarily conduct disordered or seriously aggressive. And that's where if you're one of the students, you're quickly rubbing out all the notes you took down and writing down, this is Professor Harold's son. And obviously he is typically developing, not atypically developing. But I use that example um, to make the point that before we um, progress towards a solution, we have to identify what may be a problem or not be a problem relative to specific influences that affect that behavior or those behaviors. Historically, <coughs> um, researchers have focused on, when we talk about environmental influences on, on children. So I'm gonna refer back to the title of the network that I lead together with Swimi and, and, and colleagues, e-nurture. So nurture is environment, nature is biology and genetics typically. When we refer to nurture, we, we are typically referring to family, family environmental influences, school-based environmental influences, and peer-based environmental influences. But proportionately, the term nurture relates to, or has focused on historically, family environmental influences on child and adolescent development with relative effects from peers and relative effects from schools. So <clears throat> what do we know about environmental influences? We know that uh, protective, supportive, uh, secure, engaging parenting promotes positive child development, supportive school environments, enhances positive child development, and positive peer relationships also enhance child development also. Negative, destructive family environments affects child development. School environments that further challenge children's development, self-esteem, mastery, competence, capabilities, et cetera, and mental health affect children's future development. And peer relationships can be highly destructive, bullying, et cetera. So each of these factors can individually affect children, collectively affect children, the positive or the negative. These influences have always been seen, if you like, to be sort of external in inverted commas, factors outside of the child. There's complex processes operating within the child, but factors outside of the child, the environments that children experience and interact with and influence. So is there any evidence for, for, for new environments? I want to just transition from that question around historical focus on particular environments to, to tell a little story, which, which really answers the question about the significance and salience of, of our historical focus on on environments, family, schools, and peers. So <clears throat> in about 2018, early, early 2018, um, I was in involved in a particular case working with a social worker who had concerns about a young person aged 12, uh, particularly in a family court context. And the concern was that the young person had expressed a, an, an intent to, to continue to communicate with his father um, via his mobile phone. And the social worker had concern that this was uh, placing the young person at risk. And in the course of conversations, a much longer conversation than I can summarize here, the young person declared that actually his father had bipolar disorder, which had not been picked up in any of the assessments linked to the family. And that actually he was a carer for his father, uh, one of several within the family. And that the WhatsApp was a family group that would allow him to see, while he wasn't directly communicating, would allow him to see that his father was doing well. And that if the mobile phone, as had been proposed, would be taken away from him, uh, he would consider ending his life. And in that conversation, very articulately explained by a 12 year old, it was the first time genuinely that I had really processed that actually the digital in interface, the device that this young person was, 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 was uh, reliant upon, was actually very positive. <clears throat> um, and as a parent of young children at the time, my, I reflected on my own, if you like, disposition towards digital world and devices and various things and regulating time on devices and the like, and realized how little I actually knew about what evidence had to say about what is helpful and what is unhelpful with respect to digital environment, digital world influences. 
but you won't need me to say that actually the digital world now entirely pervades young people's lives. Present generation of young people, children, teenagers, indeed early adults, have grown up in a world where the digital world has been with them from day one. I come from a generation where the digital world is an entirely new feature of life. So the question has to be asked, how do family environmental factors, school environmental factors, peer relationships operate relative to children's mental health and development when considered in a new environment and the con contributions a new environment can make to those particular traditional influences, with, that is the digital environment. Very important to, to clarify here. So this is not just asking the question, what direct influences does the digital world engagement with devices have on children's development and mental health? That's one of our questions. But actually, how do children interact and experience family life, peer relationship life, and school life in a digital world? And it's that latter set of questions that um, from my own review of evidence and conversation with experts in the area, realize that actually we don't have a great deal of knowledge as to how we inform parents, carers, teachers, and those working in peer advocacy agencies and groups about digital world influences and what helps and what doesn't help. So how do we now understand family, school, peer, the interplay between biological factors and environmental factors in a digital world? And how do such collective influences affect children's mental health and development? <clears throat> you will know this, these are somewhat old stories, but in conversations with parents and in, as a parent, if you try to look up the evidence, you almost have a binary set. Increasingly, it's becoming less dichotomous, an almost dichotomous set of evidence. Some saying um, internet engagement, um, social media engagement, I should say, sorry, social media engagement, et cetera, uh, is um, negative in terms of children's mental health and development. Adults can't necessarily keep up, parents can't necessarily keep up with new information. Other reports saying that actually there's nothing to worry about or it's less to worry about than people might imagine, particularly around screen use and the like. So there's a huge amount of con conflicting evidence as to what places a young person at risk, how the digital world and related devices can enhance and be helpful in terms of development. And actually, when is engagement a problem? When is engagement potentially a, a, a positive? These questions were asked 12, when I say 12 months ago, pre-pandemic. Uh, debates around screen time and regulating screen time, et cetera, uh, had not preempted or had not, was not prepared or ready for the amount of time that young people, adults are now on devices because of home learning and changes in the, in the way uh, education, workplace, et cetera, has had to adapt. So where are we with our knowledge? And <clears throat> um, with those various questions in practice that, that I outlined, um, early part of 2018, mid 2018, the United Kingdom Research and Innovation and Economic Social Research Council put out a call for new mental health networks. Myself and colleagues, including Susan McVie in Edinburgh, people may know, um, applied for one of these networks and actually put together eNurture, uh, the Nurture Network, a network designed to ask the question or to try to address the question is how do we equip parents, teachers, practitioners, uh, policymakers, and young people themselves with information, support, and resources that promotes positive mental health in contemporary and future digital age. So that's what our network is about. As I said, we are one of eight networks. Each of the networks have a complementary focus. They all, they all focus on mental health and, and add value in terms of each of the core questions each respective network asks. Um, this is the this is the web the, the front end web page of our for our network e nurture. I'm going to go through this quite quite quickly. But um, Swimi Chan is on the call, so, so if you go onto this website, you'll learn much more about the network than I have time to go through today. But the network outlines precisely what our objectives are. The core um, raison d'etre of the network and each of the networks is actually to provide uh, research funding for uh, projects and those groupings that come together to develop projects to fund research that addresses the network's objectives. So we're in a position to fund small scale projects less than 10,000 pounds, mid-sized projects less than 25,000 pounds and large projects less than 45,000 pounds that uh, address our core uh, research questions. How do family, how do we support family, school, peer related agencies in terms of young people's mental health with a focus on the digital world. In our first round of funding, we funded five projects, 2019. We've just completed our second uh, uh, round of funding. We've funded seven projects. And we have a third round of funding, which we will activate towards the end of this year, September, August, September of this year, which people here on this call may be interested in, in looking at and perhaps applying into. 
Uh, one of our big, uh, most proudest components of the website is this particular, is this resources phase, um, resources page, I should say. If you go onto the resources page on the NERC, you will find a very long list of resources across all areas of relevance to mental health, but particularly with a focus on parents, schools and teachers, and young, people's them, young people themselves, in terms of how we provide information and support around mental health, not just picking up and, and including information that exists already, but also using the funded research projects that are linked to our uh, to, to eNurture and what those projects are developing in terms of new knowledge will be located on this web page and with new information uh, prospectively as we as we move through the new found, new round of funding. And uh, this is the web page. We have just over sixteen hundred Twitter followers, I understand, and just over uh, four hundred, I believe, Instagram followers. Um, important to say that our network has a core academic uh, leadership team, an advisory board of multiple experts across relevant domains, and multiple, multiple partners, all of which you can find on, on our webpage. We work very, very closely with, with, with young people. We have a youth panel up to the age of 25 years and uh, specifically working with partner schools, secondary schools and primary schools, who contribute to all phases of our network, our funded research projects, and regularly contribute to uh, blogs and activities and webinars uh, through we, through eNurture. We um, and again, I encourage you to go to the website and learn about those partnerships, which are absolutely essential to our success and, and, and future progress. Just to acknowledge the funders, and I hopefully I've finished in time to let you now ask me any questions you would like. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a great introduction to eNurture. Um, and what we'd really like to do now is obviously open up the uh, question and answer session um, so that you can put um, any questions to uh, to Gordon about um, either eNurture or um, screen use. Um, so if we use the Q&A facility, uh, you should be able to type in if you have any questions. Um, I will maybe start us off just with the questions. So you were saying that you, um, you're working with uh, schools at the moment with, and obviously funding these, uh, the projects. Um, do you notice a bigger sort of uptake from secondary rather than primary or is it the, is it equal? Well, every school we've asked to participate has enthusiastically agreed to participate. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, primary and secondary schools. I think we're also um, mindful of capacity to work across our schools. So the schools contribute directly in that each of our um, funding rounds and activities that we promote to the network um, have the input from our school partners. So when it comes to the, fund, the, the projects we fund, uh, a particular group may apply into the, into the fund for a small, medium or large grant. They, they, if they're successful in terms of recommendation through through the kind of peer review, the academic peer review processes, etc., they then go out to the schools, and we have focus groups with the schools, where the schools then ask questions of those teams that they would like answered, con you know, compatible with the original proposal. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the project, we then have a, an event for our funded projects, where those young people and their schools and teachers will come along to, and actually mm -hmm. ask questions. Um, mm -hmm. There'd be nothing, I mean, you won't need me to say this, be nothing but exceptional. Um, the factor that, it, not the factor, one of the observations made most frequently was initially was, was it appropriate to engage primary school children when it came to the study of mental health? Uh, I'm in Wales, Cardiff, John Donald, as I said earlier, so there's a you know, big initiative in Welsh government around mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And actually when we engage with the schools, one of the comments made by uh, a young person, a six-year-old person said to me, well, well, why wouldn't you ask us? If you don't ask us, how would you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Important. We've had, uh, we've had fantastic engagement with the with, with the schools, and mm -hmm. as three years on the call, we you know we have uh, before we went into lockdown. Obviously, since lockdown, it's all been remotely, but still engagement through through Zoom and Teams and various things. But mm -hmm. we had in in school visits, um, and you know, small working group and focus groups with 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 with, with primary school and secondary school, um, and absolutely nothing but exceptional uh, engagement and enthusiasm. Well, that's fantastic. I probably have a whole host of questions that I could ask you just now. However, I am going to go to the Q&A box just now as we've got some questions coming in. And just a reminder to everyone on the call, if you'd like to ask questions, if you put them into, type them into the Q&A box, I'll pick them up and put them across. So um, 
from uh, Christina. Um, there's a question, is there specific training and support for additional support needs schools? Via e-nurture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the answer is, is, is yes, there is additional support. So one of the uh, um, events we had planned, I'm not sure that I didn't get the person's name who asked the question, is, is actually while working with the schools that we would have events um, targeting teachers and actually targeting parents. Um, so we've had, I wouldn't want to say six events with schools where we directly worked with teachers. So going out to the schools, imparting information on e-nurture, developing resources and materials that the schools can then use to distribute to parents and, and to pupils. Uh, and we had several events planned where we actually would engage with a group of parents, parent evenings, for instance. Um, and the plan is that as we get back, uh, being able to, to visit schools and also put events on put events on working with the schools, that we will increase over the next year of the project, direct engagement with schools, those we're working with, and then resources to go out to other schools that we're not working with directly, but who, who may find the information helpful, all around how we support teachers working with young people in dealing with digital world interface, but particularly with a mental health focus. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, second question um, here is from Gareth Braddock. Uh, could you give examples of projects that you have funded? Lots of them. Um, uh, so we have projects funded whereby, do I give you an example of each? So a small, a small grant project was a project uh, brought together where people were looking to develop, to, to produce um, some films around raising awareness around mental health, particularly again working with schools and bringing a group together that could promote that particular outcome. We have another project where. Uh, a group is looking to use quite uh, what's called a tactile approach to digital interface for children with particular learning disabilities. Um, and we have a, several projects where um, the focus is on communicating back to families and working with families information that allows to have a more informed view of the positives and the less positives around digital world engagement. Now, all, all of the projects have youth and young people direct involvement. Um, so they're all quite interactive in terms of in terms of the communities they work with and represent. That's a summary. If you go on the webpage, I think it was Jonathan, all of the funded projects are listed on our webpage and you'll get uh, additional details as, as, as to what those projects are focusing on. Okay. That's from Sumi, just preemptively um, there. Yes, Sumi's just put um, the uh, the link in the in the chat there. So that's great. Um, so uh, from Joe Inchley, uh, it says here, thank you, great talk. Can you say a bit more about the interaction between individual level factors and the social context in relation to the impact of digital technology? Uh, while use of digital technology can have many benefits, are some young people more prone to potential negative effects? Yeah, I mean, that's, an acad that's a research question, I think, Joe. Um, that's, <laughs> that's classically, you know, individual environment interaction that you're, I think you're getting at there. Um, I mean, the answer is probably yes, individuals potentially have greater susceptibility or risk when it comes to engaging with any particular environmental factor. So, so being able to interact in a way that is promotive rather than, uh, interacts relative to susceptibility in, in a negative way. We know, for example, with very young children that actually engaging with iPads, for instance, or tablets may be facilitative in terms of motor skills and the like, but also may be maladaptive in terms of engaging particular brain region activation that's linked to addictive behaviors and low levels of self-control. So, so in terms of the science of interaction with, with the digital world, um, we, we are, revisiting questions that have a, a, a historical focus. People will often say, well, is the digital world any different than interacting with TVs, say 50 odd years ago? It, it is, <laughs> we know that. Um, how and the mechanisms I think people are exploring, evidence will suggest that yes, there are individual factors that place a young person or a group of young people with those individual factors at greater risk. Um, and therefore understanding the mechanics of how that risk is activated is a key scientific question. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe's followed that up actually saying, you know, it obviously has implications for schools in terms of providing support to vulnerable young people. Um, so has anything come through in terms of working with the schools where they've, they've wanted to focus on identifying those, those sort of links and, and interventions? So I think there's two answers to that. I hate to give 
I wouldn't have had two answers 12 months ago. And saying 12 months ago will explain why there's two answers. So initially, uh, when I say initially, in the first phase of our um, first round of funded projects, one of the uh, key objectives was actually to work with schools and identify how we could provide information whereby they could provide support for young people with particular support needs. And that might be communicating home in terms of being able to access information at home, might be an education, more of kind of an education focus, um, um, emphasis around support, working with families that don't necessarily have access to resources or understand digital resources to help young people, for example, with homework. So, so identifying gaps whereby ultimately the, you know, there's positive engagement that young people, young person support needs. Now, in pandemic, and you know, in terms of digital poverty and all of the issues around simply accessing devices to assist with basics such as schoolwork and engagement, it's a whole different landscape. So, so I think we're, we're revisiting the questions we now need to ask urgently around that very that specific focus, Dawn, is, is how do we now provide information for schools that it, uh, to an evidence-based strategy works with families, works with the young people, the interface with schools, and that it promotes and supports mental health entirely different landscape than it was even 12 months ago. Okay, thank you. And uh, so I'm just going to put across now um, some comments from Jude Breslin, who's written in as well, um, uh, who's uh, delighted to hear about the work and um, is working with young people to co-design new community mental health and wellbeing supports and services. Um, and the comment that digital support is part of this work. So is there research that they could be learning about to inform the design and the balance of face-to-face -face versus digital and any finding about uh, findings about what works and doesn't in the digital world for mental health? Yeah, very, uh, <laughs> um, I would encourage looking at the eNurture website and particularly on the resources, you'll see resources for work, in, work for researchers, working for, 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 for teachers, for families. Um, there's a huge shift in services provided online and through digital mechanisms now than again would have been the case 12 months ago. And um, so that, that landscape is exponentially and rapidly shifting um, to a more digital friendly um, platform, set of platforms. And um, so there's, there's huge shift there. In terms of what works, it really depends on what the particular targets are. Um, so again, I would suggest looking at the eNurture uh, webpage in terms of resources specific to that, to the focus that eNurture has. Shifting around social care practice, of course, and medical practice also quite quite different, but nonetheless moving to a digital interface rapidly. Mm -hmm. And Suimi's just put the link into the chat there for the resources as well. So thank you. And Jude actually carried on with a comment there um, to say that uh, many of the young people that she's working with didn't have a positive experience of school and don't want to engage in anything that schools do. So has any work been done with schools to engage uh, young people who are maybe not keen on the usual methods of school engagement? Usual kind of educational methods around? Um, I don't know whether, uh, let me just reread the question. So I'm assuming that's through the digital formats that, that schools are using? Yeah, again, I think it's, a, 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 you know, um, I think, again, in terms of in terms of the particular um, issues that 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 uh, groups of, again, pupils, young people, such in schools may be experiencing, I think specifying the question more directly might help help me give an answer. So, so e-nurture e will focus on addressing questions that are brought our way by schools, by family interest groups, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of evidence around the, again, lockdown uh, impacts on, on educational experience as compared to school experience. Um, we know, for example, that children with particular neurodevelopmental difficulties have actually adapted to lockdown better than other groups. Mm -hmm. uh, have had greater difficulty returning to school than other groups. Um, some young people report a, a real sense of loss having been kept away from schools. The challenge of then promoting and allowing peer relationships and relationships with, with friends and others to exist via a digital interface 
um, again, a whole new world of, of unknown. Um, so I think there's, we probably have more questions now than necessarily substantive answers. All of these areas are being looked at in terms of research. If people are interested, another possible resource to look at what, what is happening in terms of research in this space is the funder of each of the eight, eight networks, the Economic Social Research Council and UKRI, had what's called a, a COVID response scheme. And you can literally go onto the UKRI webpage. It's really, you won't have access to this particular link, but the UKRI webpage, United Kingdom Research and Innovation, UKRI. I can send this to you, Dawn, if it's helpful after this. Mm -hmm. call. Um, you can distribute it. Uh, and you can click on that link and see what research is being funded across the proverbial piece on all things to do with, with COVID response. And a great deal of projects, a large number, I should say, a large number of projects funded are specifically around school response, community response, uh, vulnerable group response, uh, practice model engagement, et cetera. And um, so that might be a useful resource to see what is happening. And then you could contact individual researchers to see what they're doing to try and inform some of these questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so please do type um, in any more questions for the moment. Um, we, I think we have got to the bottom of the list and the, on the Q&A for the moment. Um, is there any work being done uh, with, in terms of quantity of hours on screens? Because I know that's always been such a contentious area. I wonder whether in school, because certainly as a teacher, I remember um, speaking to pupils about screen time and they would turn around and say, well, you've just had us on the, looking at a whiteboard for the last uh, 40 minutes, which was, you know, very relevant comment. Um, so it is very difficult. And obviously children now have, have their own devices that they're being encouraged to use. So again, we've kind of upped the hours yet again that, um, that we're putting children in, in front of screens. And is that, does that form any of the research that's being done or? Yeah, I mean, that's a core question for, for, for e-nurture. <clears throat> so you're absolutely right. We, we up the hours that young people are sitting in front of screens. Depending on area of employment and, and other factors, we've also up the hours that adults are sitting on screens, mm -hmm. that teachers are sitting on screens, that all of the, the family, the peer, the school, environmental influences, if you like, the good old fashioned definition of environmental influences is entirely shifted to a screen. Mm -hmm. so, so what does that then mean for parent-child interaction, for teacher-child interaction, for peer-to-peer -peer interaction, um, and the experiences those interactions have now that they're working through a screen. Um, so I think, I don't think, it is very clearly the case that the social, the, the classic social interaction dynamics that we try to you know, inform by way of practice models, et cetera, teacher, child, parent, child, et cetera, it's entirely shifted. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And I said at the outset, you know, it would have been the case 12 or so months ago, that kind of heuristic advice around screen time, you know, ranged from no more than two hours in a single sitting based on the child's age and stage of development. So it's, you know, 50 minutes with 10 minute blocks broken, not, no more than, than, than three hours, um, regulating, you know, uh, shifting uh, contact time by, by having regular breaks, all of that sort of stuff. <clears throat> Now we require young people potentially to be on screens, you know, up to six hours a day mm -hmm. uh, and in the evening and respond to requests. Schools might, so, I, you know, <clears throat> my own son might get a request. I get the email at seven o'clock at night uh, because the program is, 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 is um, timetable for the following day has shifted. And mm -hmm. I'm having to, to, you know, interrupt his evening and say, okay, we need to change what we're doing tomorrow morning. I'm available to help with that. If I was not, available to help with that, you know. So I say all that, and, and I say it's not just to applaud the, 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 you know, the predominant audience in this call. You hear a lot about the need for schools to support young people in their, in, in their transition through this period and, and, and all that's required in over these recent months. A little bit about trying to support parents, employees, et cetera, from you know, various employers, et cetera. The speed at which the schools have adapted to, to an online interface has been absolutely incredible. Mm, yeah, I would agree, absolutely. <laughs> <Amazing>. <laughs> so, I, the first thing to say before we try to understand all the negatives is try to identify, not to identify, not be afraid to, uh, to speak to and highlight the positives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, teachers moving to online format, pupils having to adapt to online format, parents, carers having to adopt to online format, employees having to adopt to, uh, adapt to online format, massive shift. 
proportionally successfully achieved absolutely with effects that are uh, hugely important to understand and regulate and support. Um, if, 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 if left unsupported, um, I think the potential for risk is very, very high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the first thing to say candidly without trying to bypass the question is simply well done, particularly the teachers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, and it is interesting, I think, in terms of the range of different models with which you can um, now reach people in terms of you know, where we might have been worried about the sort of language development and would still worry about the language development. Um, there's other forms of communication through yeah. through video, through pictures and so on as well. Um, That's exactly right. I mean, you, you've had a really important, I mean, so you know, one example is to language development. So if it was the case that we could communicate to, to those who have the resources to offer support, parents, others, about reading, sitting down, spending time reading, conversation, taking time away from screens, actually saying, actually, we're going to switch off for an hour, a certain time of the evening, we're going to speak to each other. Um, like, I mean, I'll tell you a funny story, and I, forgive me if this is slightly trite, but one of the casualties of lockdown for me was um, right before, it was in Simon Cardiff, right before we went into the Christmas week, whilst government locked Wales down with two hours notice, all of my Christmas presents had yet to be picked up the following day, clicked and collected the following day. I couldn't pick any of my Christmas presents up. So I spent the next day frantically online trying to buy presents, of which one was a pool table. I would never buy a pool table understandably, but I decided this was going to be a good present for the family. And actually, uh, it was, because we spent a large proportions of Christmas standing around a pool table, nobody being particularly good at it, but speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. And it really makes the point that switching off where you can and where it's realistic uh, and spending time speaking to each other is an absolutely essential um, uh, facilitator mm -hmm. you know, of, of, of the types of um, social interaction um, uh, opportunities and, and, and benefits that we all we all need, um, adults and children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all those practical skills as well. So I'd just like to um, thank you again for sharing your your time and expertise this afternoon. I'm just going to have a last check of the Q and A, just in case I have missed any questions coming in. Um, and chat. Um, so for those of you that are able to access the chat, there are the uh, web links there that Sumi has, has put up if you'd like to access some of those resources that, uh, that Gordon has mentioned during the, um, during the webinar. Okay, so um, lots to think about there and uh, I'm sure uh, Many people uh, will be tuning in and having a look at the eNature website, which which sounds as if it has some great resources there. So um, I will call this webinar now to to a close. Um, so with our, our best thanks, um, we will say goodbye for this. Pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Stay well. Thank Thank you. Bye. Bye.